And this evening's sample class is a history class. So I don't know if any of you attended our last sample class about a few weeks ago. And history is a little bit easier for those who participated in the English before because it does not require any prerequisites. So any students who are here, I do encourage you to try to participate. All right, so I'll be introducing then Sister Maria Aloysius is our teacher for this evening and hope you enjoy the class. Today we'll be looking at what is actually the greatest naval battle of the 16th century, Battle of Lepanto, obviously. But can everyone go into their formative first? I just want to ask a quick question before we dive into it. Give me a thumbs up once you're there. Anna's in, Lucia, Sophia, Luciano, Ryan. Good. Try answering the first question. What do you already know about the Battle of Lepanto? I'll give you about a minute. Shouldn't take too long. Just what you know off the top of your head. Causes and effects, who was in the Battle of Lepanto, any interesting facts about it, anything you know. All right, you have about 45 seconds. Twenty six seconds. All right, time. Mr. Whittlesey, can you read your answer? Uh, the Battle of Lepanto was a large-scale naval battle off the coast of Greece in 1571 between Ottoman forces invading Europe and the Catholic Holy League that was formed to protect it. Supposedly, the victory by the Holy League was delivered by the Virgin Mary. Wow, a perfect synopsis. Mr. Whittlesey, I'm impressed. You must be a historian. And Sister, could I interrupt you real quick? Just want to give a tip to some of our participants that I've been watching. So for those who are participating as observers, as guests, I do have a recommendation for you. Right now inside your Zoom, uh, there is an option to turn on a setting called side-by-side -side mode, and I highly recommend that. So if the board is not big enough, or if you want to expand the teacher view, you can do that by once side-by-side -side mode is turned on to grab that center divide and drag it back and forth. Thank you. Sorry, sister. No, no worries. All right, so we've had Ryan Whittlesey's perfect synopsis. Sophia Iannotti, why don't you read yours? I'm pretty sure yours can rival Ryan's. I'm not sure if my synopsis is as detailed as that, sister, but um, I put that I know the Catholics won the battle, and I didn't type this, but I believe also that it was due to the Holy Rosary that had to do with the victory. Very good, exactly. We're going to dive into that, but we're actually going to go into a little more detail than just causes and effects. We're going to look at, number one, the political landscape of the time. In order to understand a event in history, you have to know what the time was like in which it happened. Number two, we'll be looking at character analysis, some of the prime movers of the Battle of Lepanto, And number three, we'll be looking at causes and effects. Fair enough. Let's start with this. Can you read the title, Mr. Iannotti? This day of Europe, dangers within and without. Good. Now, before we dive into the bullets, just take a look at the title. Why would this be a very precarious state for a country to be in, to have dangers within, but also without? 
let's see, Anna Connolly. It's a very dangerous state to be in because a country could be threatened not only by civil war and revolutions, but also other nations surrounding it could easily take over while it's in a weakened state. Good. Can anyone add anything to Ms. Connolly's explanation? Ryan? Um, usually when the surrounding nations sense the weakness from internal strife, they know to go in and attack. So that Very good. Me. Exactly. When there is a power vacuum, everyone dives in. They all want a share in that power. So yes, it's extremely dangerous. If a country is weakened within, countries without are going to start coming in. But let's see, Sophia Ayanati, can you read the three bullet points? The moral disintegration of Catholic Europe by the re Renaissance, humanism, and heresy. The civil strife between peasants and nobles. The increasing Ottoman expansion in the Eastern Mediterranean. Thank you. Let's start with the first one. Why would moral disintegration be dangerous to a country? I mean, we have moral disintegration everywhere now, in America, in Europe, in Asia, anywhere you look, there's moral disintegration. Why would that be dangerous, though? Let's ask Mr. Lozano. Because moral disintegration could lead to crime, and crime could lead to revolution. Very good, actually. It leads to crime, it leads to disorder. There's a disorder in authority, which leads to a lot of problems in a country. What about the second one? Civil strife between peasants and nobles. Let's scale it down a little bit. Why would this be dangerous to a town or to the average European citizen? Let's see, Anna Connolly. Civil strife could be dangerous to the average citizen because it could easily lead to like a revolution where the whole country is going to be fighting each other. Then there's no food probably because people will be fighting over that. There's soldiers everywhere. Innocent people will be caught in the crossfire. There's going to be a lot of death probably. Good. Can anyone add anything to that? Sophia? I agree with what Anna said. Also, um, because it's between peasants and nobles, that sort of gives the impression that maybe the peasants don't feel like that they're being either well represented or they feel that they're inferior or they're being unjustly treated, maybe. So that could that feeling could lead to the civil strife. Good. That's a very good point. Mr. Lozano, do you have something to add? People wouldn't want to work and that would lead to the downfall of an economy. Good, exactly. Economic problems as well. All those are big problems. This, however, is going to claim a little more of our attention. Does anyone know what the Ottoman Empire is? Let's see. Mr. Whittlesey. Um, It was this empire of Turkish people from Anatolia, and they kind of came sweeping through Eastern Europe very quickly. Um, and in a totally unexpected way that kind of unbalanced the uh, political scene. Before, there was the Byzantine Empire, and they were not interested in aggressive expansion towards Western Europe. But the Ottoman Empire was very interested in that. Um, so that threw off the balance of power in the region. Exactly. That's a good synopsis of Europe at that time. The Ottoman Empire actually extended for 600 years, only disbanded in 1922 when it broke up into tiny little countries. But at its height, it actually encompassed much of the known world. Mr. Ayanati, can you look at the map and tell me what countries look like they're under the influence of the Ottoman Empire at this time? Greece, Hungary. Good. Syria, Egypt, Al Algeria. Oh, that's good. They actually have most of Southeastern Europe, all the way to the gates of Vienna, actually. Vienna, Austria. They have the Balkan regions. They have large parts of North Africa. They have large parts of the Arabian Peninsula. They have lots of the Middle East as well. They're basically the powerhouse of the 15th and 16th century. Plus, they control almost all the major ports. Why would that be an important power source for a country to own almost all of the major ports? Let's see, Mr. Lozano. Because they are the one getting the trades in from other countries. They manage the trade routes to other countries. 
perfect answer. They manage the trade routes, which means what has to go through their hands. Ms. Connolly? Trade uh, food, all the money sources of a country. Good. So, Mr. Whittlesey, I actually have a question for you. Since you know most about the Ottoman Empire. What exactly was their goal? What was the Ottoman Empire's goal in Europe? Because, as you said, they were part of Turkey in Asia Minor, Anatolia. What was their aim? What were they trying to do in Europe? Um, well, f first of all, they everyone just loves conquest, even the Ottomans. But um, they also wanted to convert most of Europe to Islam because they were the... Um, as you can see, they controlled the entire Islamic world at the time, and the Muslims saw the Ottomans as um, the head of the caliphate, uh, which is the this organization. It's basically a giant Muslim empire, and uh, they wanted to invade Western Europe and um, convert them from Catholicism to Islam. Um, another thing they were very interested in was um, Vienna. That city was seen as kind of the gateway um, into the West. Good answer. Exactly. They want, it was for religious reasons, number one, and number two is for conquest. They wanted power. But in order to get that power, they actually needed to conquer three places, three places only. The island of Malta, which is, let me show you on a map. The island of Malta is actually extremely small if you look at it on a map. Malta is here. They needed the island of Malta, extremely tiny island. They also needed a place called Cyprus, which was controlled by Venice, which was a little bit over here, a little bit of a trip. And they also needed, as you said, Ryan, Vienna and Austria, which was all the way over here in the heart of the mainland. Those three places, because Malta was the crossroads of Europe. Vienna, because if they took Vienna, they could cut off Italy from the rest of Europe and take it over very easily. Cyprus, because it was a major port. Fifteen twenty nine, they tried to take Vienna. Fifteen sixty five, they tried to take Malta. They failed in both areas. Knights of Malta were able to repel them in one of the most epic sieges of history. If you don't know it, I would suggest looking it up. It's extremely interesting. Vienna, they were repelled by Archduke Ferdinand I. But now, 1571, they're going to try to take Cyprus. So go back into the formative. Open up your iPads. Try to answer the second question. Seeing that, why is this time, 1571, the perfect opportunity for the Ottoman Empire to strike, to target Europe. I'll give you about a minute, one minute. Time starts now. Thirty one seconds. Ten seconds left. time. Luciano, why don't you read yours? I said they they already were extremely powerful and had a lot of territory and they wanted to expand their power and territory. Good. Can anyone add anything to that? Ms. Franta, do you want to try? I also said, sister, that the countries were also not as united and so this was the perfect opportunity. 
Good, exactly. Can anyone add anything to Luciano's and Lucia's? Let's ask Sophia. Can you add anything to your brothers? Well, um, sister, I think that the previous slide when we talked about Europe being weakened from within, I think that would apply to this, I, Good. I believe. So therefore, the, that would include the civil strife between peasants and nobles and the weakening of religion. Exactly, yes. Anything else? One more thing. Looking for one more thing. Mr. Whittlesey. Uh, there was the Protestant Reformation. Exactly. 1517 Protestant Reformation, which contributed to the weakening of Europe from within, because now everyone's no longer, they no longer have one mind. And the sultans knew that. They no longer had one mind. They're all going in different directions. So they're split. They're easy to target. Good. All right. Big part of history is reading and comprehending. I want you to take a few minutes, about three, read this to yourself, and then see if you can write a one-sentence summary about the Ottoman threat using what we talked about and the information on the board. Three minutes, your time starts now, and the question is informative. Two minutes, 45 seconds. Wow, Mr. Lozano, you must be a very fast reader. You're already typing. Two minutes, 14 seconds. About one minute left. Your answer is good so far, Mr. Lozano. I would also add, what are they doing about it? It's true, you just put what's, hap what's happening at the time. But you should also add, what did they decide to do about it? Twenty-two seconds. Ten seconds left. time. Ms. Franta, read yours. I have that the Ottoman Empire was at the height of its power and thus was threatening Christendom, so, so Pope Pius V decided that he needed to start a crusade to protect Catholic Europe, but Philip II of Spain was the only ruler who responded to his summons. That's a very good summary, actually. But hold on, Lucia mentioned something interesting. Who is the only country to respond when Pius V called for a crusade. Miss Connolly? Spain. Spain. Why is that? I mean, all countries are being threatened by this. England, Germany, Austria, everyone is threatened by the Ottomans. They're taking over everyone. They don't care who's who. Why is it only Spain? Mr. Whittlesey? 
it might have something to do with the fact that um, Spain just recently kicked out the Moors from their own country, so they still have that memory of Muslim oppression. That's a good answer. Can anyone add anything to Mr. Whittlesey's? Ms. Connolly? Europe was very divided at this time. Um, Henry VIII had died of 30 years before, I think. And so there was a lot of fighting between Protestants and Catholics. And Spain was the only country that was willing to respond because everyone else was fighting each other. All right. Not a bad response. Sophia, do you have anything? I saw you raising your hand before. Yes, I was actually going to say something similar to what Anna said and just add that if the other countries were overwhelmed by Protestantism, they weren't going to want to unite under the Pope of the Catholic Church in order to fight off these invaders. So it would make sense that if Spain was the only predominantly Catholic country at this time, that they would be the only one to respond to the Pope. Good. That is a good point. However, I'm thinking of one thing in particular. We mentioned that the Ottomans controlled all major ports, which means they control all trade. Why would that make it very unattractive to some countries to want to ally themselves against the Ottomans? Luciano, why don't you try it? Uh, wait, I'm sorry. Did you ask? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the last part. Did you ask what I typed in or what I think that they let's see actually that's a good question <laughs> no don't worry let's see can someone repeat the question let's see mr lozano um why would it be unattractive for some countries to make themselves not allies with the people who control the trading ports good luciano do you have an answer to that because it would show that rather than fighting for what was rightfully theirs, they would just submit to like, tyranny. Well, that's true. You're almost there. That is a good point. Mr. Lozano, you have anything to add to that? Um, you would not want to make yourself enemies with the people who can trade the trading ports because then you wouldn't get anything. And you wouldn't be able to get food, money, cattle. Exactly. Actually, that's a good, that's a very good point, actually. Because think about it, think of it in terms of modern times. What country are we allied to that we rely on heavily for trade? Let's see, Mr. Whittlesey, have any ideas? Well, the, the country we rely most heavily on for trade is China, but they're also our main geopolitical enemy. I, I would say actually <laughs> most of the world relies on us for trade. Um, good, well, yes. Yeah. Actually, that is true. Most of the world re relies on us for trade. Our major trading partner, though, is China. So if China decided to declare war, what do you think would be the decision? Would we ally ourselves with the Chinese or against them? And why would we choose either? What would be reasons on either side? Anna? I personally believe we would probably go against them simply because we have the capability to fight them off. Um, it would not be pretty though, but I believe we would do that. All right, good. Lucia. I think we would feel like we shouldn't because we rely on China for so much of our, we buy so many things from China and the United States um, sells a lot of China's things. So if we went against China, we would then have to start start producing all of the things that China had provided for us beforehand. That's true. No more cheap Lego sets, imitation Lego sets. But Ryan, do you have anything? Um, yes, it would be mutually assured financial destruction because our economies are so intertwined. Actually, that's a very good point. It would be extremely destructive financially. So they would have to have a lot of conversations about that. In this case, let's go back to 1571. Philip II of Spain is the only one to respond. Why, though? What's his agenda? What's his modus operandi, if you want to put it that way? Let's see. Can someone read this 
Luciana, why don't you read it? Philip II, King of Spain. While Elizabeth of England, the kings of France, and many German nobles allied themselves with the Turks time and again against Catholic nations, Philip II was consistent in his fight against the enemy of the Christian name. He put his half-brother, Don Juan of Austria, in charge of a naval expedition against the Turks. Through, sorry, though a true son of the church, Philip saw himself as the representative of God in temporal ma matters, which made him difficult for the church to deal with. He was no portrait called Sosiego, strong self-consciousness and sleepy indecision, which would cause many problems later. All right, then what is his agenda? Why is he supporting the Christian name when everyone else is not? Let's see. Mr. Whittlesey. Um, well, if, if he saw himself as the representative of God in temporal matters, he might be trying to prove himself by fending off the Muslim hordes and saving Europe. That's a good reason. Yes. Does anyone have anything to add to that? Let's see. Lucia. Well, it also says, sister, that Philip saw himself as a re representative of God. So he probably, um, his conscience would have probably bothered him had he not done anything. Actually, yes, that's a very good point. A personal motive and also a religious motive. But it mentions someone else. Right now, we've jumped into character analysis. We've looked at Philip II of Spain, but it mentions that he's not the head of the Holy League. His brother is Don Juan of Austria. Take a look at him. What's your first impression of him? Just looking at this picture, how old do you think he is? Let's see, Miss Connolly. He looks very young, like he's in his 20s or so. <laughs> he is actually extremely young. He has his first military experience at the age of 21, barely out of school. At the age of 24, he's at the head of the Holy League. So he's, so what can you assume about his character? If he's that young and they're putting him at the head of the Holy League, trying to stem the Ottoman threat that's coming to invade all of Europe, Mr. Lozano. He is a good military strategist. <laughs> good. Uh, he's good. Would anyone say he's more than that? Mr. Whittlesey. He's probably got a lot of youthful vigor in him, so he'd probably be very bold in attacking the enemy. Good, that's a good point. He is very young. He'll have a lot of courage. Lucia? He probably had very good leadership skills as well. That's a good point. And actually, it does mention something about all of your points. Let's see. Mr. Lozano, why don't you read it? Don Juan of Austria was the half-brother of Philip II and Italian military commander. At the age of 21, he had his first experience in warfare against Moorish pirates in the Mediterranean. At the age of 24, he was placed at the head of the Holy League against the Ottoman Turks. Enthusiastic, sometimes foolish, but always brave, Don Juan was always able to unite the quarreling admirals against the Turks and sailed to Lepanto near Greece to meet the invaders. So it was true. It was a little bit of a ragtag group. You have Venice, you have Parma, Alexandra Farnese, you have Spain, basically a conglomeration of all these tiny little countries besides Spain. And thing is, a lot of the generals from the different countries were actually considered military geniuses. Alexandra Farnese was considered one of the greatest military geniuses of his time even though he's very young. Admiral Doria was considered extremely good at naval military expeditions. And when you put a bunch of geniuses together in a room, guess what happens, Sevilla? Usually you have a bunch of geniuses in one room who are all good at the same thing. Well, I would sort of think that there would be a bit of a competition in a way, they would, <laughs> because they would always, um, 
you know, if they're all geniuses, they all think that they're right. And so they're. <laughs> yes, exactly. A little bit of pride, a little bit. They all think they're right. So they're all going to say something a little bit different. Don Juan of Austria's strength, though, was, able to, was being able to bring them together and make them fight as one. However, we're finished with character analysis. Let's look at the actual battle. Mr. Whittlesey, why don't you read this? On October 7th, 1571, the Christian fleet of 264 vessels carrying 26,000 soldiers and 50,000 rowers met the Muslim fleet of 300 vessels manned by 120,000 men. Faced with these powerful odds, Don Juan knelt and prayed, and the wind, which had thus far favored the Turks, shifted west, and the Christian ships sped forward. Thank you. All right, let's do a little bit of strategic math, shall we? Do any of you like math? <laughs> Anna does. It's, it's a little bit hard to like math. But let's do just a little bit of it. What are the odds? Christians versus Ottomans. Think about it. You have 264 vessels, three on, 300 vessels on the Ottoman side, 26,000 soldiers on the Christian side, and 120,000 soldiers on the Ottoman side. What are the odds facing Christians at this point, if you had to take a guess or an estimate? What do you have, Luciano? No, so using a calculator. Um, I would guess, and I would guess that the Muslims would win. Do you want me to give like, do you mean like, uh, figures ratio? like numbers? Anna, they're at least four times larger than the Christian fleet. At least. All right. Do any of you play sports? Let's put this in perspective, shall we? Have you ever played soccer, let's say, on a team that has one less player than the other team? What was it like, Anna? Um, it's it was fun, but it was not um uh, it's it's hard. It is hard, yes. What about if you have two less players? Take a guess. Let's see. Sophia. What if you have two less players than the other team? And the other team's a lot bigger than you. Well, it would be very difficult because that would mean if, you know, if there's 11 on each team and then you're down to nine, you're doing the work of, you have, okay, <laughs> you have to be able to still keep the other team in control, even though you're significantly outnumbered. So there's two extra people that you don't have that could be doing something to contribute to the team, but they're not there. So that's very difficult. Exactly. Yes, Mr. Whittlesey, I'm guessing you have something to add to that. You'd better pray a miracle happens if you want to win. <laughs> exactly. Yes. But here's the thing. It's four to one. So think about that in terms of a team, a soccer team. That'd be like four players on one side, about 16, 15 players on the other side. Not very good odds. It's incredibly intimidating plus the ships are a lot bigger however though does anyone know the actual outcome of the battle the actual outcome of the battle Lombanta. let's see sophia i believe the christian fleet ended up winning actually they ended up winning how is that how could they end up winning against such overwhelming odds? It's four to one. A ragtag group of Catholics against the Ottomans who have been battle-hardened, practiced, they're ready to crush Europe. Why? Anna? The wind shifted, and I believe the Ottoman ships rammed into each other. That's true, yes. The wind did shift. It was favoring the Turks at one point, but then it shifted in favor of the Catholics. It was, it was, incredibly, it was incredibly strong wind. It 
push the ships against each other, as you said, Anna. But does anyone have anything else? Usually when battles are won against overwhelming odds, there's usually some other factor at play. What factors would those be? Lucia. Would it be divine intervention? Very good. Yes, divine intervention, number one. Basically, what Mr. Whittlesey said, ask for a miracle. <laughs> okay, what else, though? Think about, for example, can you think of any other battles in history where the underdog won, where they won against overwhelming odds? Mr. Lozano? Military strategy. Yes, that would be one of the things. Military strategy or military prowess, Mr. Whittlesey. Uh, well, we've been reading about Alexander the Great in history class, and um, in some of the first battles, um, he just pressed on in an incredibly brave manner and personally led his men. And um, just from personal leadership was how he won most of those battles against Persia. Good, exactly. That would be an example of military prowess. For example, have you ever heard of Thermopylae? The Battle of Thermopylae, overwhelming odds, 300 Spartans against the whole Persian army. Agincourt, Henry V, against the whole French army. That's an example of overwhelming odds where military prowess succeeds despite overwhelming odds. Or they use subtlety and trickery, usually. For example, let's see, there was, think of Gideon's army. Gideon's army was incredibly small, 300 men. But they use subtlety and trickery and the intervention of God in order to win the battle. The intervention of God in this instance came through the hands of Our Lady, which is why we look at the victory. It puts it in a class of its own, that it was a divine intervention that caused the victory. Let's see. Sophia, can you read it? The victory. Through the intercession of Our Lady, the Catholic fle fleet not only defeated, but almost annihilated the enemy. The Turks lost 224 ships and 25,000 men. They never dared to attack Christian Europe by sea again. The Battle of Lepanto was the greatest naval battle of the century. Pope Pius V, seeing the victory in a vision, ordered a feast to be celebrated on the day of the battle in honor of the Most Holy Rosary, and it is still celebrated by faithful Catholics to this day. So, Sophia, you're correct. It's due to the intercession of Our Lady of the Rosary, who is also called, in this instance, Our Lady of Victory. So if you're ever wondering where that title came from, it's from this victory. And if you look at the picture, actually, it's very interesting. You see Our Lady interceding for the Catholic League, and you actually see the patrons of the countries that were involved, St. Justina, St. Mark, who are patrons of Venice, you see St. Peter, patron of Rome. You see St. Roche, who's the patron of Parma. This picture actually highlights very well the fact that it was divine intervention that caused the victory in the end. However, does anyone know the aftermath? Because usually when you look at a battle, you skip the victory and you just look at the aftermath. Does anyone know the actual aftermath of the Battle of Lepanto? What happened after? Wow, I finally stumped Mr. Whittlesey. <laughs> usually, when there's a crushing victory against overwhelming odds, usually you see a change in hands of power and lands. Nice way to rhyme it. You usually see the country that won taking the power, taking the lands, anything that they conquered from the losing side. You don't see this in the Battle of Lepanto. Actually, what you will see is almost the exact opposite of what you would expect. So prepare yourselves. It's when I first learned about it, it was a little bit shocking. Lucia, can you read it? Unfortunate, oh, sorry, the aftermath. Unfortunately, the immediate results did not correspond to the greatness of the victory, owing to the habitual indecision of Philip II, the death of Pius V in 1572, and the mercenary policy of Venice. Don Juan of Austria, dreaming of an independent Christian principality in Africa, conquered Tunis in 1574. But the jealousy of Philip II, encouraged by a false counselor, left him without the necessary support, and Tunis was again subjected to Turkish rule. 
Don Juan spent the rest of his short life battling in defense of Christendom. He died at the age of 31. All right. Some of it needs a little bit of explanation. Why would this reduce the effect of a victory? Habitual indecision. Anna? After a victory or in anything in politics, you need someone to make a quick decision and stick by it, a strong decision. Time is very, very precious. And if you waste it, so many different things can happen. Since Philip II didn't make a decision, he wasted a lot of the time that he could have used to go and build on his momentum. Good, exactly. He didn't build on his victory, which is why a lot of it was lost. The death of Pius V, he was the soul of the Holy League. Once he died, it kind of fell apart. But this last one is probably one of the most shocking. Venice, after fighting for Cyprus, actually sold it back to the Ottomans right after the battle in violation of the treaty in violation of the terms of the Holy League. They said you can't sell it back, but they sold it back in a separate treaty in order to get back their commercial trading rights, which is why it's mercenary. However, though, despite this, why is it considered still a great battle if the aftermath is like this? Why would it still be considered great? Anna? Uh, even though the aftermath might not have been very good, um, it still is, without a doubt, extremely important and great to recognize that s the people who were outnumbered four to one were able to overcome that and win. Anything else? What makes a battle? What makes someone consider a battle be truly great? Zoom out a little bit. Zoom out of the Battle of Lepanto. Think of any battle. Why is any battle considered truly great? Think about that for a second. Let's see. Anna, you have an idea? I was going to say the story of it almost, the heroism, the what you can draw from it, the courage, bravery. True. Yes, the lessons you can draw from it. Usually it's because it was able to change history. A battle is usually considered great because it changed the course of history completely. Guess what would happen if the Ottomans won? Europe would be completely different than it is now. Which is why the Battle of Ponte is so important. It completely changed the course of history. So, now that you know all of that, go into your formative. Last question. I'll give you five minutes to answer it. This is question number four. Can you summarize what happened at the Battle of Lepanto? Make sure you include our three points. We had political landscape, we had character analysis, and we also had causes and effects. So you'll have five minutes, your time starts now, and see what you can come up with. All right, you have 37 seconds left, not much time, just enough to wrap things up. So remember, you need political landscape, character analysis, causes, and then the effects of the battle. Eight seconds left. All right, that's time. Mr. Lozano, you've been busy. Why don't you read yours? The Battle of Lepanto was a battle won under unsurmountable odds. To begin with, the political landscape was in favor of the Ottoman Empire, with them ruling all of the major trading ports. 
This meant that going against them was a huge risk in and of itself. Nevertheless, Catholic defenders such as Don Juan and other military generals created a glorious military strategy. On the day of the battle, strong winds caused by divine intervention caused the Ottoman ships to crash into each other. This created an opportunity for the Catholic forces to strike and astonish the world with this incredible victory. Nevertheless, the aftermath only worsened the situation for Europe and the surrounding countries. Not bad. All right. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Otherwise, usually I would have everyone critique yours. I'm sure Ryan has much to say, as usual. I would usually have others critique you, see what is opinion, what is fact. Opinion is important in history, but you need to distinguish between the two. We would see if we need to add anything or take anything out. But all in all, Mr. Rosano, it looks like you got a lot out of it. All right, unfortunately, we're out of time. I'll have to turn you over to Sister Mary Magdalene, but I hope all of you enjoyed it. All right, Sister Mary Magdalene. Thank you, Sister. Yes, and I'm sorry, I was instructing Sister. She had to end early just a minute ago because we are a little bit over time and we are supposed to wrap up in three minutes here. So I did ask her to skip over her last section, which was in our Anal analysis of the answer. And then I think she also had a couple other things to go through in regards to how to analyze history. So I'm sorry, I, I interrupted you there. <laughs> uh, so to, to wrap up, I just wanted to point out a few things for the parents who are observing. Um, one thing to note about the student work. So this is one platform we commonly use during class is that the uh, the view that we have of the students right now is different than what you would see in the classroom, except for actually, if you look at Sophia and Luciano, they have the a required view so that the teacher is able to ensure that they are sitting up straight, they're following the uniform code, they have a really good view of the classroom. And at different times, the teacher can also control both the school computer and the iPad if they were managed. We do ship the students equipment from the school so that that is possible. Um, one thing that we're able to do just, just within Zoom is focus mode. So if there was a test during class, a history test, by enabling focus mode, the teacher could restrict everything but their selected view so that you couldn't see the other students in the class. You could hear them if they spoke, but you could not see their view during the test. So there are different scenarios for different classes that are used and it does change the technology, but overall the technology is simple enough that within a few minutes, most students are able to participate sufficiently for the teacher to determine effort and mastery of whatever skills they're trying to enhance, their logic, their reasoning, their analysis, reading comprehension, et cetera. And that br brings me to my last point, which is all of the classes have campus students. That is one thing we do not have this evening. It's a little too late to ask some of our campus students to come in, but normally you would have campus students participating simultaneously, which gives more camera views. And we simply do that for our own standard. It actually allows us to analyze that the online student is having an equivalent education as that on campus.